a warm welcome to everybody. Uh, I'm delighted to be with you. My name is Don Henry. I'm Professor of Environmentalism at the University of Melbourne. We've got a, a special uh, webinar today where we're celebrating the first year anniversary of Melbourne Climate Futures. Uh, and we've got a great panel with us today to talk about some of the challenges we're facing, uh, opportunities and challenges this year with some reflections on last year and what it means for climate action. Uh, firstly, I'd like you to join with me in acknowledging the traditional owners of this land. We're coming for, to you here from Wurundjeri country, and I'd like to acknowledge their elders, past, present, and emerging, and also to acknowledge um, how important the knowledge and experience of Indigenous peoples are around the world as we face great sustainability challenges. Um, with this event, what we'd like to do uh, as an anniversary of Melbourne Climate Futures is to focus on and reflect on last year. We saw a number of very important reports, science and otherwise, from the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. We also had the important international negotiations called COP26, Conference of Parties 26 in Glasgow, towards the end of the last year, which was a, a crucial forum for global decision making on climate action. And so we'd like to examine those, these two years last and looking forward to this year, and particularly to pose the question, have we done enough? Can and what can we do more to advance uh, climate action? One of the great challenges we face around the world today. Now we're really fortunate. We're joined by a wonderful panel and I'd like to introduce them to you if I may. Uh, firstly, we're privileged to have the Lord Mayor of the City of Melbourne, uh, Sally Cap, with us. Thanks, Tom. Uh, Sally, great to have you here. And Sally, I, I know you're the first woman directly elected to the council. Mm -hmm. That would be twice now. It is. So uh, congratulations. And wonderful to have you here. And I know you've got a distinguished background in public service and the private sector. So we're really looking forward to your insights uh, at this panel. Um, I'd also like to warmly welcome Professor David Caroli. David, wonderful to have you with us and you're recently retired from CSIRO with a distinguished career in um, atmospheric science, climate change, and now an honorary professor at um, the School of Geography and Atmospheric Physics Science at the University of Melbourne, and of course, with Melbourne Climate Futures. Happy to be here, Don. Great to have you, David. And then could I introduce very warmly, Professor Jacqueline Peel. Uh, Jackie's a professor of law, very distinguished in the area of climate law and environmental law. And we're really fortunate that Jackie's the inaugural director of Melbourne Climate Futures. Jackie, great to have you here. Thanks so much, Tom. Pleasure. Let's jump straight into some discussion. Uh, what I wanted to flag to everybody is we'd warmly welcome questions. Uh, we're proposing to have a, a discussion uh, amongst the panel for roughly the first half hour, and then looking forward to engaging your questions and discussions from you. You can pop your questions in for us, and I'll do my best uh, to make sure we cover some of them. So thank you very much. Uh, let's jump straight in. David, I just thought it might be uh, helpful to start us off just with an update of the climate science. What, where, where's your assessment of where the climate science is at now? Some people will even be wondering, do we have a bit of a sense on some of the really unfortunate dramatic impacts we're seeing in Australia, be it floods or as we sit here, there's a major bleaching event um, killing some of the great, uh, great Barrier Reef. So would you like to help us with a little bit of an update on science, thanks? Yes, and, and Don, you've got to recognise that I could talk about this for the next six hours, but I know <laughs> I've got to sh shrink this down to like less than a minute or something like that. So yes, you're absolutely right. Two key reports, 
were released by the Intergovernmental Panel of Climate Change around their sixth assessment report. The first one came out in late last year. It was called Climate Change, the Physical, climate, physical Science Basis, and it covers the science of climate change. Mm -hmm. And then at the beginning of March this year, we got the second working group report that came out, the second phase, which is the Impact Adaptation and Vulnerability Report. Mm -hmm. The science is even clearer and even stronger. Yes, global warming is continuing. Yes, greenhouse gas concentrations in the atmosphere have continued to rise. Yes, we are seeing more extreme weather and climate events affecting all countries around the world. Climate change is unequivocal. We know that it's happening. The impacts are covered really more in the second report mm -hmm. which focuses on impact and adaptation and for australia and, and david am i right that second report has just recently come out is that's that correct? correct the second mm -hmm. report came out at the beginning of march so it really only came out a little while ago but if anyone's interested the key information is summarized in what's called a regional fact sheet for australia and there are nine key climate risks Many of the standard risks, the sorts of things that you were talking about, the risks associated with climate change associated with, for instance, the bushfires in 29, 2020 that we've seen, increases in heavy rainfall events that led to the flooding mm. earlier uh, in February that were affecting uh, Southeast Queensland and New South Wales. And now, yes, the increases in marine heat waves leading to mm. coral bleaching. Those are getting much worse. I'll talk more perhaps about policy a little bit later on, but there's some key, if you like, conclusions. I'm going to hand over back to you because I think it's critically important that we cover a whole range of things here. David, thank you so much for that. Uh, perhaps to also introduce us, if I may, um, Jackie, we've had really important decision making going on uh, on climate change last year and facing us this year. I just wonder, can you just help us with, um, and this is a challenging question, like David said, it requires probably a six hour <laughs> answer. Um, could you just help us with your assessment of what came out of the international negotiations in November last year called uh, COP26, and also we're tracking into another important negotiation end of this year um, called COP27. So just give us your sense on where decision-making and, and policy and law is at. Yeah, thanks, Don. Look, I think COP26 at the end of last year had a lot of hype um, yeah. and also a lot of hope because we were talking about it being the world's last best chance to keep 1.5 degrees alive, which of course is so important to the degree of impacts that we know that we might face. Mm. Um, what came out of COP26? I think there were some really positive things. Uh, it was the first time that countries were really road testing, if you like, the new international climate framework, the Paris Agreement, mm -hmm. um, because countries hadn't met in 2020 because of COVID and mm. the agreement only came into effect really at the beginning of 2020. So, And, and Jackie, that if I may, that Paris Agreement in 2015 was highly significant because yeah. all countries agreed very important goals. And Glasgow was particularly important because countries were due to strengthen their commitments five years after Paris. So that's what you mean by road test. Yeah, absolutely. So, I mean, Paris is different because it's all countries, 196 mm. countries coming together to agree on climate ambition. And we're really hoping going into COP26 that we'd see a ramping up of that mm. ambition because we know that it needs to be strengthened uh, to, to avoid the worst impacts of climate change. And I think largely we did see a lot mm. of that strengthening of ambition. Um, particularly uh, the Glasgow Climate Pact, which is the sort of decision that came out of the conference. It does reference uh, countries' uh, many pledges that they made in advance of the meeting, but also calling on those countries that are not doing so well. Uh, and Australia is definitely included in this group to make sure that before the next meeting, um, they're coming with strengthened 2030 targets. I think alongside that, there was some language in the uh, pact about phasing down 
um, coal-fired power, which might seem mm. like pretty fuzzy language, but uh, mm. coal has been sort of the Voldemort of climate negotiations <laughs> and climate <laughs> law, you know, its name shall not be mentioned. So for that group of countries to say, actually, fossil fuels are a problem, we need to take action is good. And then, of course, we saw a range of sideline agreements um, with groups of countries who are willing to go further, saying we'll take action on methane emissions, we'll take action on coal financing and a range of other issues. But your second part of the question, Don, was about what more needs to be done. And particularly as we head to the what's being called the African COP, COP27, which will be held in Egypt. And I think the key thing, the thing that I took away from COP26 was that the developed countries like Australia got a lot of what they are asking for. They got increased ambition, they got transparency, they got rules on carbon markets and trading. But developing countries, our small island nation states, including our Pacific neighbours, um, a lot of those countries, I think, felt fairly shafted by the negotiations. And if we're really going to, to meet the climate action goals under the Paris Agreement, if we're going to have a, a just and fair and inclusive response, we really need to be addressing the issues that developing countries are most concerned about. And that's adaptation, that's loss and damage, and that's who pays for yeah. all of this yeah. action that needs to go ahead. Can I interrupt a second? Because yes, one of the critical things that came up both in COP26, but also in the IPCC assessment, is the importance of limiting greenhouse gas emissions, particularly coal-related carbon dioxide emissions and other fossil fuels, to limit global warming to well below two degrees, aiming at one and a half degrees. The IPCC assessment concluded that we are very likely to exceed one and a half degrees of global warming in the 2030s or before 2040. And the only hope then is to ongoing reductions in emissions so that we maybe overshoot and then return to limiting global warming to one and a half degrees. We have to act more rapidly if we're going to achieve that goal. Mm -hmm. And we need to phase out fossil fuel use completely. And I notice, Jackie, if I'm recalling correctly, um, that the Glasgow negotiations acknowledge this as the critical decade that makes or breaks that opportunity to hold or rein in uh, average global warming to 1.5 degrees. But I'm hearing it's critical for reducing emissions, but also supporting adaptation and the building of resilience. Let's, let's come back onto that. Um, could I bring Sally into our conversation? Because Sally, I know you participated in some of the panels mm -hmm. around the COP and I think a real source of hope for many people has been the leadership from cities around the world. Now, please feel free to take this conversation where you'd like, but I'd be interested in your assessment coming from a Lord Mayor's perspective particularly on cities and maybe state governments and what you're seeing in that space and what needs to happen more. Mm. Well, it's lovely to be part of this conversation. Don, I absolutely agree. I think one of the uh, key enhancements of the COP discussions is now that incorporation of cities into mm. the program and into uh, the panels and into the innovation. Um, but importantly, the commitment. So at COP26, there were 1,000 cities, including the city of Melbourne, that signed up to 1.5 degrees. Mm -hmm. I think this is uh, an important recognition of the role that we play, but also the leadership that cities are showing as we really tackle what is you know, one of the biggest challenges in our lifetime. From our perspective as well, the panels and the coming together was very much around the sharing of actions that we are already taking. The learnings and the sharing through those sorts of forums is, is absolutely critical for us to maintain, but really accelerate our pace. You talked earlier about the more that has to happen uh, for us to mm. achieve our ambitions. Actually, the pace at which it happens uh, is, is equally as important. And through cities, we're really encouraging each other to do more. So on the Mayor's panels, we were really hearing about the detail of implementation of projects from tidal power, wind power, um, policy objectives and how we're going about it uh, and uh, how we can work together 
Uh, and I think those sorts of forums are, are key because we're seeing more, I think, particularly in Australia, of a bottom-up approach to how we're going to achieve these national and worldwide targets. And having a focus on those discussions and actions is important. Sally, did you see the same thing or do you observe the same thing in other countries? For example, uh, the US. So uh, is that a bottom-up approach we're seeing from cities there as well? It is. I think uh, whether it's COP26 discussions or it's other forums like C40 or ICLE, uh, we're involved in all of these and so are cities around the world. Uh, I see it also on Mike Bloomberg's um, Mayor's Forums across the states, which has been very COVID focused, mm -hmm. as you can imagine, yeah. during the pandemic, but swinging back now onto these big issues where mayors are talking about the actions that their cities are taking in the absence of uh, a comprehensive and coordinated national policy. And when I'm talking to young people, we had a forum before COP26 with our local young leaders and activists, and all of those people are talking about action. Mm. It, it's, it's beyond uh, time for action, let's face it. Yeah. And uh, whilst these forums are very important, don't get me wrong, we need to see more of that action on the ground. And, uh, Sally, if I may, uh, taking up your lead there, speaking mm. about young people for a sec, mm. um, you know, as a university, we've got a really crucial role mm. in educating the younger generations as they come through. But I want to use your point, if I may, to segue to something quite interesting that's happened just last week. Um, there have been a group, and I'll, I'll ask Jackie to help us with this. So onto a question of environment mm. law, there was a fantastic group of younger people uh, assisted by a nun, not quite so young, uh, who actually took the environment <coughs> minister to court, arguing that there was a duty of care in decision-making for younger generations. Now, it's a complicated court action, but I think just a little bit of an update on that, Jackie, and any insights you'd have. But I want to acknowledge the fabulous efforts and commitments of younger people that we're starting to see make a difference in lots of different ways. Yeah, and of course, um, the, the reason that we're seeing uh, a lot of action by youth is because they recognise the immense um, impacts that climate change is going to have on their future. So that's why they're so activated. Um, and one of the areas that they've been trying to activate in is using the courts, which responds a bit to Sally's point that if we've got an absence of federal government policy emerging, where else do we look? We might look to cities and we might look to other institutions like courts. Um, and that's essentially what the children in this case called the Sharma case were trying to do. They were trying to argue that the environment minister, um, in making her decisions about an extension on a coal mine under our federal environment legislation, actually has a duty to consider how that decision would impact on future generations, um, on kids at the moment who will be adults when these these climate impacts are taking part. Now, there's not a good news ending to this particular mm. story. Last year, we did see a very good news story when the kids were successful at the first instance. So they went before a single federal court judge who said, yes, this is actually one of the greatest intergenerational injustices of our time. And it should be the case that the minister has a requirement, a duty to consider the interests of children when making decisions on coal mining projects. That was appealed by the minister and the most recent decision for, by the full federal court, which is sort of our second highest court in the land was actually um, turning down the appeal. So the, the children um, and advocates in the case lost in the court appeal decision. That's not a great news story because mm. it effectively says that under our environmental legislation, the minister doesn't have a duty to consider human safety and the impacts on children when making decisions about coal mines. But if there is a silver lining, it's on the science. Mm -hmm. um, so the right. minister did actually try to challenge all of the scientific arguments on appeal that had been um, uh, put forward in evidence in the first round. And the full court um, drew a line under that. They didn't accept any of the minister's challenges. So okay. David's spoken about how at, uh, in the scientific community, these things are regarded as fact. There's no question. That's been a little mm -hmm. bit different in the legal community. 
but this case at least puts a, a legal stamp on the science to say actually those arguments are yep. closed um, and that will provide a bit of a springboard for future litigation because you in terms of proving things like the health impacts of climate change and that they particularly impact young children we've got that kind of base settled in in the law as well and um, Jackie I noticed uh, in one of the um, excuse me I'm a scientist not a lawyer <laughs> Do you, one of the judgments is that yeah. the correct word yeah. um, I there noticed were three of them which yeah. made it extra complicated yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I, I noticed in one of them if I'm recalling correctly yes. um, the judge said look it's actually the role of parliaments to be clear on the policy settings and the responsibilities it's not mine now I've watched law enough to know that's an ongoing debate but it does segue us into an important point because the judge was really saying hey this is a policy issue so I wanted to bring um, David and Sally uh, back in so uh, you know policies are really important mm. in this space of course what business can do and what individuals can do is really really important and the law but from a policy space I, 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 um, if I may draw out both your views on if we think about um, Australia what's some policy settings that would help us accelerate action from on climate change that you both feel are really important at the moment as we as we're into 2020 David, may I ask you to sure. lead off? Yeah, look, very happy to do that. And it's clear that the science evidence is provided very clearly in the IPCC reports that I talked about. Mm -hmm. And the most important conclusion in terms of what I would describe as reducing the magnitude of climate change, global warming, mm -hmm. is seven words in the IPCC science assessment report, which is that every tonne of carbon dioxide emissions adds to global warming. That means that every time that we drive a car driven by petrol, every time that we use fossil fuel generated electricity, every time that the Australian government or the New South Wales government allows for increased coal mining, burning fossil fuels, it makes climate change worse. We can make choices about whether we want to make climate change worse or not. Those are policy decisions, but it needs to be borne in mind that any policy that supports ongoing greenhouse gas emissions makes climate change worse. Mm -hmm. That's as simple as it gets. The separate concern is the policy around responding to the impacts of climate change. And that's equally important and much, much harder if we don't limit global warming as quickly as possible. Mm -hmm. Sally, could I bring you in, please? Very good. National context. Let me talk about cities for yeah. a moment. I think policies are absolutely key for providing uh, the framework in which we're going to deliver. From our perspective, we've got two very strong policies. One is the waste and resource recovery policy, as well as the climate mitigation policy. And we've set our targets, and that is 100% uh, renewable energy across the city, our municipality by 2030, mm -hmm. and zero net emissions by 2040. These are very mm -hmm. ambitious targets. And to help us with pace, we also declared a climate and biodiversity emergency in 2019 to really internally and externally show that commitment to accelerating uh, the implementation of policy. That's led to some um, key programs that are underway. Uh, which we're really proud of and uh, and it goes to two things from our perspective one is what we can do as an organization um, to that extent uh, we've been carbon neutral since 2012 but what really helped us take a leap forward was the melbourne renewable energy program uh, that kicked off in 2017 it's effectively power purchasing agreements for wind mm -hmm. energy and in 2019 we had the first of those programs first of their kind in australia in that we partnered with organizations like melbourne university mm -hmm. and big energy users across the city uh, to uh, enter into these arrangements and not only does it mean we use 100% renewable energy as individual organisations but two of those programs now mean that we've taken 
out 5% of the emissions across the municipality. I take that as a really big step forward. Yeah. It's the equivalent of 28,000 cars off our roads to go to the fossil fuel point. Um, the response we've had to that from the big energy users is enormous and those programs continue. But we've now had an overwhelming response from residents and small business owners who aren't the big energy users, but want to be active. So how do these policies relate to them? That's why we've started Power Melbourne, uh, which again with Melbourne University is a great partner, is about uh, batteries and the storage and then distribution of renewable energy across our city, another Australia first. We're in pilot phase at the moment, and I can share more about that, but really testing the technology, uh, really looking for a wave of innovation in battery technology, but it is jobs training and really that awareness and engagement uh, of our, our population. And the last thing I'd say is we now have an all embracing approach at the city of Melbourne where every policy needs to consider the environmental impacts. And that's really come together through the UN Sustainable Development Goals. Mm. We're the first city in Australia to undertake a voluntary local review. Uh, when I've got to say, not all of the news was good, um, but nonetheless, we've taken on that challenge of really assessing and benchmarking ourselves across the 17 goals, but many of them have environmental impacts and some of them are direct. And that's been an enormous effort to say, this is where we're at and we can do better. And uh, for us as the first city in Australia to do it, we're really telling the world and our organisation and our municipality that we're serious about creating change here. And Don, if I may, I think what Sally's comments really point to are the importance of innovative policy, mm. uh, yeah. engagement with communities, but also leadership. And we're seeing that across the Australian landscape. Yeah in many dimensions mm -hmm. um, but not always at our national level yep. um, and yep. we spoke before at the very start about our 2030 targets mm -hmm. which we know uh, in Australia are lagging behind other developed countries so yeah. but we, there's so much that cities can do there's so much that yes. businesses and other actors can do but we also need our national mm -hmm. leadership on it we'll yeah. continue to advocate for that absolutely that's great and Jackie, I might pick that up. It's a really important point. Yeah. But I just I first want to ask, Sally, I'm just trying to do the figures in my head. Yeah. Congratulations. Yeah. And I think if every developed country yeah. was doing what you're doing, those net zero by 2040 yeah. and 100% um, you know, renewable by 2030, did yes. I hear you right? Yes. I think we'd be on track to hold average global warming below 1.5 degrees. Now it would need the developing world <laughs> commensurately, but that's sort of in the ballpark mm. of what has to happen. David, am I right or right off the mark? Uh, Be a bit generous here too. Okay, so please. not right off the mark, <laughs> but one of the critical parts yeah. is from the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change is developed countries need to take the lead yeah. in addressing climate change. So. We're recognising that, but actually to limit global warming to below 1.5 degrees, we need all countries to have zero carbon dioxide emissions by 2040. Right. That means developed countries need to take the lead. That means before 2040, we need to have net zero carbon dioxide emissions. And even then, there are many other factors that mean we're likely to have yeah. this period. So realistically, whatever we do, we're likely to exceed one and a half degrees, but we need then ongoing action. So when we overshoot, we can then drag the carbon dioxide mm. out of the atmosphere in a range of different technologies and approaches so that we can overshoot and then track back to limiting global warming by the end of this century down to one and a half degrees. Yeah. It's likely we'll overshoot. We need to stick below two degrees and then track down to one and a half degrees. No, thanks, David. David's going to be knocking on the door, Sally. Yes, but I, I just want to, um, just on your progressive policies, I think a curiosity a lot of us would have, what's been easy and what's been hard as a political leader to bring your constituencies along? Because you have a strong business and residential constituency. So the politics of struggle with climate change. So would you share just a couple of quick insights? What's been hard and what's been easy? Hmm. 
Well, the hard bit is that people at, at the very base don't really like change and we're asking right. for massive change. Yeah. And uh, that is uh, really the sort of highest point, if you like, in terms of understanding the, the battle ahead. And when we then have important institutions like levels of government who aren't necessarily willing to lead change, that then compounds through uh, our community. At the other end, though, uh, what's really interesting is I would say we are pushed to be taking the positions that we are. And when we look at uh, communities like the city of Melbourne and the people who are our constituents and, and vote for our leaders, I would say that's actually one of their demands of us. And so when I go into different forums, uh, uh, whether it's advocating for uh, more uh, policy at a national level or whether it's uh, looking at different actions that we can be delivering, I am really uh, feel the confidence of doing that because I feel pushed by the constituents that I represent. Mm -hmm. Now, across our municipality, of course, we have the broad range of views, but the majority of people say to us they have an expectation that we will do more. It's why we declared the emergency in 2019. It's why during the pandemic, even though we were faced with immediate crisis, we still had an expectation from our constituents that we would main, remain dedicated to progress on issues like climate change. And that's why we were part of the lead group at C40 during the pandemic to keep responding uh, to climate change challenges. So uh, I feel lucky to represent a, a community that prioritises climate change. And so we can continue to act in that way. But one of the other biggest challenges is really the role that media plays. I don't know if you want to comment on this because uh, that's, that's where a lot of the debate or better debate could happen, but mm. it is where a lot of the shutting down of debate uh, occurs. And I just think, for example, around our transport strategy, another major strategy that helps us mitigate and adapt to, to climate change, where we're having some real battles at the moment around active transport and its role in our city. I think it's a no brainer, mm. uh, but unfortunately there are parts of the media that really want to shut it down um, from we don't like change to not under, understanding really the benefits that it has. So I think us being able to have more of these sorts of discussions and proper debate to tease the issues out is important. Sally, thank you so much. Just on Sally's challenge there about media would anyone have a quick comment they'd like to add there i'm sure david's turning to <laughs> well <laughs> now that we've raised it, it. it's an interesting <laughs> space it is mm. critically important that open discussion is available you know to, to everyone and to all perspectives but governments policymakers talk about evidence-based policies or evidence-based discussions. There are some people who make up their own evidence around climate change and things like that and mm. still get a massive profile in the media around climate change misinformation. So at some stage, the information and the facts around the scientific basis of climate change is not up for debate anymore. Mm even though it appears to be on some newspapers and some media channels. If I can just add to that, I mean, I think part of the motivation for setting up uh, uh, an initiative like Melbourne Climate Futures was so that that um, evidence-based voice mm. is uh, intervening in these yeah. debates much more. And I think um, that's a really important function that we can play. I think it also rests with academics mm. <laughs> and experts to make sure that the messages that they're communicating yeah are suitable for um, a broader yeah. community and that we're communicating really that the science is settled. Yeah. And the big questions now are about how yeah. um, and also by when, uh, yeah. which we know has to be occurring yeah. very urgently. Let's, if I may, panel, um, let's bring in some questions from the audience. Thank okay. you very much. I know a lot are coming through. And one of them leads on, if I could invite, um, Sally and Jackie to address this. We've got a couple of questions here about what's, what policies do we need at the federal arena in Australia now? And Sally, you could, you could take that from the point of view of what would be more supportive of local governments, mm 
or wherever you'd like to take it. But let's uh, let's explore that question. What sort of what what policy settings should Australia have in place for appropriate action on climate change in 2022? Well, look, I'll just kick off with one which um, is, is really prevalent to a lot of the discussions we're having. And we know that out of COP26, one of the more disappointing aspects was that we didn't have a, a national government that was willing to really commit to, uh, to do more around uh, fossil fuels. And uh, from our perspective, we want to become a clean energy innovation centre here in Melbourne. Um, we love, you know, the whole um, Ross Gano uh, leading the, the challenge about being a renewable energy superpower, and we think we've we've got a great opportunity to do that. Uh, and one of the um, things that we get caught up with debates often is what does it mean for jobs and what does it mean for our economy? And from our perspective, to have a national policy that really talked about the pace at which we're going to change, so set some targets there. Uh, but also what's going to happen in the transition time to introduce new jobs, mm -hmm. to look at new technology, to understand what the opportunities are so that we build confidence about the transition and the change that we're going through. To us, that would be instrumental mm -hmm. in how we could go about fostering more activity locally. Um, that would be enormous. If I can just say the biggest emission, apart from transport, which we don't control, but the biggest emitters in city settings are existing commercial buildings and the way that they mm -hmm. embed, uh, then use uh, energy and yeah. what that means for emissions. And for us, the biggest impact there would be about the use of fossil fuels. So if we can start to see some of that change at a national level, that would really help us in a local city setting as well. Just a quick aside, Sally, on the jobs, because yeah. this is debate. You mentioned the power purchase agreement yes. that Melbourne's done and mm. University of Melbourne's been part of that. Just explain that very quickly. And I assume that's generated jobs somewhere. Well, it has. And mm. it's and in Victoria, so two power purchasing agreements now, yes. uh, which means that we have um, effectively two wind farms that have been set up in northern Victoria. Mm -hmm. um, it's jobs in, in both delivering the wind farms and then ongoing operations of the wind farms. But more recently, as we've been settling our own policies, we've looked at what the job opportunities could be from being a clean energy innovation centre in Melbourne, Victoria. And it's estimated there are at least 123,000 jobs that could be generated from transitioning to renewable energy. And mm. that is exciting. And we should be yeah. more involved in those discussions and the skills and the education and the technology and the know-how. And I feel that there is a vacuum on that sort of discussion nationally that could help with that transition at a local level. And if I can just pick up on that, Don, because I think this has been a really central part of the debate. When you go to negotiations like COP26, other countries are just amazed that we have all of these resources. Yes. We can be a clean energy yes. superpower, but somehow we have uh, the developed world's least ambitious targets for yeah. reducing emissions mm -hmm. and getting off fossil fuels. Um, and I think that is because uh, the economics and the, the debates around jobs, sometimes yeah. fueled by an unsympathetic media, have really come to the mm -hmm. fore. But there are also really big questions around um, the transition and, and supporting the transition, coordinating the transition yeah. that Sally referred to. Mm -hmm. And the national government hasn't really done a good job here. If you think about uh, some of our regional communities, particularly our coal communities, yeah. um, mm -hmm. who are bearing a lot of the, the sort of front-ended costs of the clean energy transition, um, the, the experiences that they report are largely of an uncoordinated process, yeah. depends on which companies are involved in, in yeah. negotiations, and it just seems to cry out for a more nationally coordinated approach and support. And that's sort of been missing in action yeah. Yeah. in yeah. our federal policy. So it, it's about the targets. It's about accountability for those targets so that businesses and other parts of the community have an idea of where we're heading. But it's also about saying this is a big change that we're doing. We need to support our communities to do that. We need to do it fairly. Um, and in a coordinated and planned way. And that just hasn't been happening, which is why we're in a bit of a mess uh, with our transition, I think, in Australia. Don, I've got to <laughs> add to this part because we focused in the discussion around the sort of policy and things around mitigation of climate change. Yeah. But it's 
equally, and maybe even more important to communities, is addressing the impacts of climate change and adaptation. And there is yeah. no national coordinated approach to mm. climate change adaptation. There mm. used to be a national climate change adaptation research facility, mm. and it's been closed. Yeah. It still struggles on at minuscule amounts of money. So what we need is a coordinated national approach. One of the key yeah. conclusions around climate risks in Australia is the inability of institutions and governance systems to manage climate risks in Australia. It was one of the IPCC conclusions. It's buried in the report, but it is critical that we do not have climate risk governance systems and institutions that can manage this well. Mm. Let me just pull out a little bit more because we've actually had two or three questions on the federal policy arena. Any other, so, so Jackie, you're highlighting transition. It's a really important role for social sciences there too, I, I, I suspect. And Melbourne Climate Futures is in the really important position in the university of being able to tap expertise across all the, the faculties. We've been talking about getting emissions down, mitigation, and we've been talking about adaptation. Any other sort of policy ideas you'd have at our federal level? We've got David's a, got 100. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Any other. We've got to have a transportation policy which encourages yeah. a transition around, away from fossil fuels and into electric vehicles. Yeah. We've got to do that 30 years ago because yeah. that's when the opportunity was arising. We still have it, but we're now being used as a dumping site for inefficient vehicles. Yeah. There's lots of other things. It's critically important to recognise that solving climate change is across all sectors, agriculture and food resources, mm -hmm. coastlines, all the other sectors of emissions and all the other sectors of impacts. And unless we treat this as a whole and complex system, there's going to be things that we miss out on. And if I can just broaden it out to the region, I think mm. also we're sitting here in Australia in a quite privileged position, but yeah. surrounded by a region that's going to have much more significant challenges, both in the energy transition, but particularly with climate change adaptation and loss and damage. So yeah. on, on the justice point, I think in Australia, uh, we talked about developed mm. countries taking the lead. One of the ways that we should be taking the lead is in terms of supporting our neighbours, Pacific, Pacific yeah. Island neighbours in particular, um, to adapt and uh, respond to climate change impacts, because that's an existential threat in, in those regions. And I think it's not just a sort of good policy decision, but it's also a moral obligation really yeah. um, for us to fulfil those obligations. And Jackie, that's a really important point, because as you said earlier, the Africa COP, COP27, is likely to focus on this and our Pacific neighbours who in many ways have created the least of the pollution in the atmosphere uh, when you look globally are in the front line of the impacts uh, as well as that the opportunity to assist uh, particularly Southeast Asian nations with rapidly growing economies transition to clean energy uh, deal with deforestation issues, as we have here in Australia, they're quite uh, profound. What would that mean from a federal government point of view? Is that a strengthening of aid budgets? Um, what other initiatives there could help? Because it's a moral responsibility, but there's also business opportunities there for Australia as well. Yeah, look, I, I mean, this... Um... This debate came up at COP26, particularly around the finance obligations and contributing to finance for yeah. um, developing countries, small island states. Um, mm. Australia has pulled out of the major um, funding mechanism, the Green Climate Fund, and is preferring yep. to do these funding arrangements through bilateral relationships and negotiations. Um, I think a really good thing that they could do is re-engage with the Green Climate Fund, the multilateral process, and um, up the commitment on, yep. on financing. But um, it also needs to be finance that's not tied to particular goals of the, of the donor government. Um, there is a real need with adaptation in particular to be hearing from the communities themselves about the needs and to utilise 
um, local and First Nations knowledge in, in the best ways of adapting in those environments where people have often lived for, for centuries, the particular communities managing the land there. Maybe to take that a little bit further, Sally, can you help us? Um, what sort of, what voices or interactions are you seeing emerging from cities in say Southeast Asia or the Pacific, if, they, if they're in your grouping there? They are, well, particularly Southeast Asia. Uh, mm -hmm. C40, for example, mm -hmm. I mentioned ICLE uh, and other mayor's forums, uh, very much organising ourselves. And it's a recognition that there's learning and sharing that goes both ways. And I think yeah. that's, you know, we, we, we need to listen as much as we speak. And I think that was the point um, that mm -hmm. was being made. So um, from our perspective, we're seeing more and more cities uh, come on, on board for these topics. Um, C40 started as 40 cities. Uh, it's now hundreds of cities involved in that group. Um, we break down by geography, by ideas, by issues. Uh, we were the 1,271st city in the world to declare the, the uh, climate and biodiversity emergency. So you can see this momentum happening in cities. And increasingly, the work that we do with other cities, whether it's through sister cities or other types of networks, uh, is coordinated through state and federal government networks as well to make sure that we are leveraging the opportunities and the investments we're making to really maximise the outcomes. And that's important from both a soft diplomacy perspective, but also from an action oriented yeah. perspective. The sharing that goes on at a city level, I think would surprise a lot of people. Mm -hmm. Uh, at other levels of government and other organisations, uh, the fingerprints that we have on each other's cities are, are fundamental. And we still get people who visit us to see the outcomes of Postcode 3000, for example, which was a, an urban mm. renewal policy from the early 90s. And it's still of interest from people around mm. the world today. And that's what's tending to happen across uh, climate projects because we need to work at a pace. So we're seeing much more of that sharing happening. Yesterday I was in a forum with Wuxi uh, and it was very much focused on green opportunities uh, coming uh, into recovery elements from the pandemic. So that mixing of climate and economic uh, action is really important. That's perhaps that's mm. also a role federal and state governments could be helping local authorities yes. across this whole region and globally with that sharing, I'd assume, yes. Sally, because that's really encouraging. Let me ask one more question, uh, honouring the questions here on national policy. So Australia's commitment to reduce emissions and legislation behind it is under the spotlight and I'm assuming will be even more under the spotlight in Egypt because out of Glasgow, uh, countries were asked not to wait another five years to strengthen their commitments, but to come back again in Egypt. And it was almost like a report card, could do better, work after school, come back into Egypt again. Um, so that raises the question of Australia's 2030 target what we should be committing to reduce to as a nation. And it raises the question of actually having some laws with teeth to require emissions to be cut. And I, I was reflecting through this, we have got some good federal initiatives that have been in place for some time on stimulating cleaner economies, the Clean Energy Finance Corporation, the previous renewable energy target, but our enacted laws to require emissions to come down are either missing or not in action. So could I get a comment on this on this space? And I'd welcome anyone there. Well, you've opened up law, so I'm going to go there. <laughs> um, because uh, I think this has been a real gap in um, yeah. Australia, that we, we lack a national legislative framework that provides both for the kind of leadership we were talking about before and accountability yeah. um, for taking yeah. action. So unlike some other countries like the UK, we don't have a Climate Change Act. We don't have anything uh, since we the carbon tax legislation was repealed um, nearly a decade ago now. We don't have a, a national piece of legislation that talks about a process for setting targets and talks about a process for how we'll get there. 
And that leaves us with a bit of a vacuum. Mm. It's been filled, as, as Sally's talked about, by other actors like cities. It's yeah. also been filled by our state governments <laughs> who have been prepared mm. to enact that kind of legislation. And we do see here in Victoria, when you have that kind of framework, Victoria has a Climate Change Act, which requires mm. targets to be set, to be renewed, for the government to be accountable for that. But you do get a greater cycle of progress. Yep. So I think this is really important. Um, and it's not enough to point to our environmental legislation, uh, which is, is really just about assessing the impacts of projects and, and has so many holes in it, particularly around climate, that it's about, and we've seen with the Sharma decision, basically not applicable to our climate change yeah. future. So absolutely, I think this is a key area that we need to address. Yeah. And the really interesting thing is there is one piece of legislation associated with the, if you like, 20 10, 12 uh, clean energy future legislation. And that is Australia still has a climate change advisory body called the Climate Change Authority, which is required to provide independent advice on Australia's emission reduction targets. And it has not reported on Australia's emission reduction targets since 2015, because it has just accepted what the federal government has provided in terms of emission reduction targets. It is not independent and doesn't have a climate change scientist on the Climate Change Authority. How can you set up a group to provide advice on emission reduction targets when they don't have the relevant people on the authority? It's a strange organization because the minister appoints the people to be on the authority. Thank you for that highlight, David. Uh, let me... Um shift the discussion to another sector. Mm. So we've got a question here on uh, what initiatives would we like to see or could the business sector pick mm. up to really accelerate action? Sally, could I bring you in first there? Do you have some observations, encouragement or needs that you see out there from the business sector? Well, we all need to be active participants in, yeah. in achieving these goals. Mm. So I think that's the first thing. And, and I, I do believe business is, is showing wonderful leadership as well. And mm. I think they're really spurred on by their staff and their customers and the expectations now that are, are out there in the community for how our uh, business organisations um, should be behaving. And they are leading. So I'd like to, to acknowledge that. Mm. One thing that's been really important from our perspective if you like, almost an internal rule, is that when we do do these projects like Melbourne Renewable Energy Program, like Power Melbourne, they must be replicable and scalable so that mm -hmm. others can easily grab them and apply them. And I think that's something that business can do very well, is to uh, pick up uh, their own policies or their own actions that are also replicable and scalable, even in the private sector per se. Uh, and that's where we will see more of the proliferation and acceleration of progress. And some of those examples are definitely the policies that business are making uh, about their own targets, uh, how they are conducting their business, um, how they're running their uh, operations internally as well. And we see that with the flight to, for example, higher quality uh, environmental standard buildings mm -hmm. uh, that uh, big businesses are insisting upon because they know that's important for attracting talent, but also delivering on client expectations. Uh, and that's been a terrific innovation to see happening within the city of Melbourne. But our biggest issue is how do we retrofit existing buildings? Right. And so how we, uh, we really need to work together on that because no one business or one part of government can solve it. And that's where we're looking um, for more of that coordinated effort. But I think business is doing a great job. Thanks, Sally. And just a side comment, if I may, the built environment sector is so important here. You know, we're hearing a lot about the debates about uh, net zero by 2050 or whenever should be, David. But it's worth reflecting, if we're building something today that we're hoping is going mm. to be here in 2050, it should be net zero today. Yes. yes. Not, not if you, and so yes. there's a, a tremendous challenge and opportunity yep. there in, in the built environment sector. It's absolutely critical. Yep. And, and uh, you know, we, we're doing a, a big project at the moment called Greenline, which has sustainability at its, mm. at its core in terms of creating, you know, more green open spaces, active transport, 
etc and a key part of that is that as a city that wants to lead and is leading in this way it has to be delivered in a carbon neutral way yeah. uh, not just neutral i should say zero mm. carbon way and so that's a big part of the planning mm. that we're going through at the moment and that's the sort of lead but but we're still well away from that so i mm. should say Let's be realistic here. It's great yeah. to see what business is doing, but there's still yeah. much more that needs to be yeah. done and same for governments. Yeah. Thank you. Um, Jackie, could I bring you in on this, this business question? Yeah, look, I, I was going to say that I, I think it is important to acknowledge the leadership role mm. that business has been playing, particularly since the Paris Agreement. That's mm. sort of when we saw mm. an acceleration mm. um, across the finance sector yeah. um, and across resources companies, uh, energy mm. retailers, yep. etc. I think there are still some tricky issues to resolve, mm. and, and this is where we could do with some mm. more uh, concrete policy settings. Yeah. One of the big issues um, for many businesses is how they're factoring in their indirect emissions, the, the, not the emissions that they produce, but the emissions from their products, um, coal burned yes. uh, elsewhere, for And that's example. sometimes called <coughs> scope three, Jackie, scope isn't three it? Scope three emissions, yeah. yeah. So how you manage your supply chains, how you influence your suppliers so that you're also bringing down mm. emissions in other parts of the economy, that's a tricky question. Yeah. Um, and I think the other thing is that we're seeing a lot of targets um, announced. The next big question will be what the accountability processes yeah. are for that. So um, it's great to see all of that yeah. action, but what's that going to look like on the ground and how are we going to track that? How are we going to know that we're making progress towards um, the ultimate goals that we're trying to get to on climate action? David, yeah. Yes. Yeah, I sort of have been involved quite a lot in some of the finance sector discussions yeah. around sustainability and particularly greenhouse gas emissions because the task force on financial disclosure around climate change has identified a whole range of, if you like, both climate risks for businesses, including reducing greenhouse gas emissions, the impact of climate change on, if you like, the materials, the people, the products, the activities of companies. And then it's the litigation risk. And it's clear that company directors in national and local businesses are responsible for the activities of the companies, liably responsible, legally responsible for those activities. And while the Australian Securities and Investment Commission has not yet fully recognised that climate change risk is a responsibility of all company directors, it is and needs to be taken into account in all business activities to minimise their climate risks. Panel, we've run out of time. And David, that's a great mm. closing because you're reminding us whether we're in business, uh, government, or in our role as a citizen, there's so much we can do and it's such a crucial time to act at the moment. Uh, would you please join with me in um, warmly thanking a wonderful panel uh, and discussion <laughs> as uh, four of us try and attempt uh, the clapping sound <laughs> of a crowd. We really appreciate you joining us and we'd really welcome you following Melbourne Climate Futures. Uh, I think you've got the contact details up in front of you. Um, thank you so much, Jackie, David and Sally. Really wonderful discussion. And we really appreciate uh, all the audience joining us. Thank you kindly. Well done, Don.